morning. Good morning, church. David says that I will praise the name of the Lord at all times. That his praises shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall boast in the Lord. Because in the Lord the humble shall thereof be glad. And he says, oh, magnify the name of the Lord with me. I don't know about you, New Life Church, but I wish you could magnify the name of the Lord with me this morning, for the Lord is good. He is good and greatly to be praised. The Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. It says, blessed are they that put their trust in the Lord and worship him. Those who worship the Lord in his sanctuary. Those who worship the Lord in the firmament of his, of his works. Those who worship the Lord according to his excellent greatness. And we are reminded in the Bible that let everything that inhale and exhale to praise ye the Lord. I'm so glad this morning to be at New Life Church. And I want to thank pastoral staff under the leadership of Pastor Kali, Pastor Law, and the rest of the crew for allowing me to come and speak a word to the children of God. I'm not very strange to this church. I know one of your elders who is an engineer of the gospel. Elder O'Perry and his beautiful wife are friends of my church in Mount Zion. And I thank God for he has enabled us to be here. I also saw Dr. Wangai is still young and active. The last time I saw him was almost 20 years ago. And I thank God that he's still given him life to work in his vineyard. Uh, the Lord has a word for us this morning. And I believe my wife and two children are blessed to be here. I saw one of the choristers here. Uh, sings with the Msani group. Uh, she's my children's favorite. Apparently, my children calls the choir Msani. But I told them it's called Msani. But they've insisted that it's called Msani. And I believe they're so excited to see her because my son has always been on my neck Asking me, Dad, why can't you invite Msani to come to the U.S. to sing at our church? And I believe today my son will get the privilege to give them an official invitation <laughs> on behalf of the church. Let us pray. Speak to us, my God. We are hungry and thirsty for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I always tell people that when I preach, I tend to be very brief because I faithfully believe in this new beatitude that says, blessed are the brief, for they shall be invited back. In the book of Genesis, chapter 22, from verses 11 to 13, the title of my sermon, Lord, I'm listening. Lord, I'm listening. The Bible says, 
Genesis 22 from verses 11. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thick and he saw a ram caught by its horn. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Children of God, this morning I want to let you know that the God whom we serve will always allow you to go through tests in life. In your Christian journey, you will realize that the God whom we serve will always allow you to go through tests. Now, personally, I do not like tests. I'm not sure about you, but for me, I never look or long for tests. Uh, could this be the reason why those of us who don't like tests struggle with our relationship with God. Uh, because truth be told that if you serve this great God, he will allow you to go through tests. I will say that again. That if you serve this great God, he will allow you to go through tests. But I want you also to know the reason of taking a test. You see, tests are given in order to discover what you have learned in a course of study. Uh, tests are given after information has been provided. After information has been provided to check whether you can retain and, and, and understand what has been taught. That is the reason why we have tests. Now, in this pericope, you will realize that God comes to Abraham. When you read Genesis 1, 22, the Bible says, God tests Abraham. And he's testing him because God wanted to know if Abraham knew the kind of God he was. God wanted to know through a test if Abraham really understood what it meant to trust Yahweh. God allows us to go through tests, children of God, to know what we really think of him as our God. And the tests from God are not about the knowledge we have about him, but the tests of God are about understanding God's character. Let me say that again. That the test of God, that God allows us to go through, is not about our knowledge about him. But the test that God gives us is for us to understand his character. And so in this scenario, it's worthy to note, children of God, that God tests Abraham after he promotes him. Stay with me, church. For God promotes Abraham by giving him a child, Isaac. So what God has promised has been manifested here. And it, it is indeed after he receives this promise after he receives this reward, that God comes around and gives Abraham a test. Why would God give Abraham a test after giving him the promised child? Because to me, it would be logical sense 
that God would test him before he gives him the promised child. Because I like, like what I said, test precedes a promotion. You don't get a promotion before you go through an interview. But in this scenario, God changes the order. For he promotes him to be the father of Isaac, and then he gives him a test. And I ask you again this morning that why would God give a promotion to one who is not qualified? But that's what God does to us. That is what grace is all about. For we are not qualified. We are not qualified to be called holy or children of God. Yet we are called that which we are not yet. And how I wish that you should stop right here and thank God that he promotes you. He promotes the unworthy before he gives them a test. That he gives life to those who are, have not earned it yet. But the church of the living God is a testimony that God promotes us in spite of our faithfulness. God gives us gifts in spite of our shortcomings. And we all need to thank God, children of God, that he promotes us. He gives us things that we do not deserve yet. You see, the test was not to determine Abraham's qualification for the promise but rather to determine his loyalty to God. Because watch this with me. Since God promised Isaac, when you read the Bible, when God promised Isaac, God tested Abraham to see what Abraham loved most. You see, many of us, children of God, we have fallen in love with what God has given us. So that God has to compete with his gifts. So God has to test us. Because the gifts and the favors that he bestows to us. That he gives us. We use them in a way that now he has to compete with them. But the gift cannot compete with the giver, saints. But understand, saints, that you are blessed just not for yourself, but to be a blessing to the world. Your blessing is to be invested in God's kingdom. But our problem in life is that we think that Isaac belongs to us. I want you to understand that anything that you receive from God, children of God, does not belong to you, but rather God has loaned it to you. And whenever God asks for it back, when God calls for it back, we cannot be stingy. We should not hold on to it because if it had not been for God, you would not have any blessing in life. And so Abraham is minding his business, the Bible says. And he's in a prayerful attitude. He's in a mode of listening. And God comes to him and calls him Abraham. Abraham. Then Abraham says, here I am. Now what I want you not to miss in this pericope is the power that the English translation does not give. It does not capture the magnitude of this moment. But when God calls Abraham at this moment, Abraham says, here I am. In Hebrew, it's not just saying here I am geographically or in space, but it's literally saying in Hebrew translation that I am listening. I am listening with the intent to do what you ask me to do. 
without knowing details. And that's what Abraham is saying. When God calls him Abraham, Abraham, he says, here I am. That Lord, I'm listening. I'm listening to do whatever you want me to do without knowing the details. Oh, children of God, understand that this is the posture and the mindset that God is trying to get all of us to have. To say yes before we know the plan. To say yes before we understand the details. And Abraham heard God speak and he was listening. And through this sense, we can understand what prayer should be. Especially when we go through difficult moments. And we are constantly praying to God. I want you to understand that prayer is not just talking to God. But prayer is listening to God. And perhaps some of us, we have the problem because we spend more time in prayer talking to God instead of spending more time in prayer listening to God. Oh, I'll say that again. When we are busy praying in our closets, the question that you should ask yourself do you spend a lot of your prayer time talking to God or do you spend a lot of your prayer time listening to God? So God can tell us what he wants in our lives. Because the reality is, church, when we pray, our prayer with God, it is a holy conversation. Where we are to be doing more listening than talking. And I want you to watch this. That after God calls Abraham, he says that I need you to sacrifice your only son. Let us call the, the statement only son. If you have read your Bible well, you will understand that Isaac is not his only son. But why would God specify and say your only son? What about Ishmael? God is making a clear distinction here that is very important for us to understand. He is making a distinction between the manufactured and the manifested. I want you to understand the difference between the manufactured in life and they manifested. You see, Abraham and Sarah, if you read your Bible, had the promise of God that they will get a child. But they were so impatient, not understanding that God works in his own timeline, that God has his own timetable. And so because of their impatience, they devised a plan to manufacture a blessing. Instead of holding on for the manifested. Isaac, the promise, was taking too long for them to come. So they decided to take matters on their hand. And God says, that's a son, yes, but that's not your only son. Because what God is saying here is that there's a difference between what you manufacture with your own strength and what I manifest with my divine strength. Are we together, church? That in life we need to understand that there are some things that we do and we try to manufacture instead of waiting for the manifested by God's power. That in life we try to be so impatient with God. You have waited for long. And God is not coming through. And so you try to devise a plan to manufacture your blessing. 
instead of waiting for the manifested. The manufactured means that if you put it together, then it is your own responsibility to keep it going. That when you decide to manufacture your blessing, it is your responsibility to keep it going. But when God manifests something, that means God creates it to eternity. And where nobody else can mess with it. What God makes, what God manifests in your life, God guarantees. So he tells Abraham that give me your son. Not, not the one that you manufactured, but the one that I manifested. Not the one that you produced, but the one I promised. He gets very specific to him. And tells him the one that you love. And he says, don't just give me the things that you can do without. But give me what you cannot do without. That is what God tells us, children of God. In real sense, what God is saying to Abraham is give me back what I gave you. I wonder if you could pause here for a moment and ask yourself a question. What do you do when God asks you to return your answered prayer? Ask yourself that question. What do you do when, when God asks you to return back your, your, your answered prayer in life? When God asks you to return back your, your, your new home? Your answered new home is being repossessed. Your answered new job is lost all of a sudden. You are answered cancer healing is back. The cancer comes back. What do you do, children of God, when God asks you to return back to him what you have waited long for and he has answered and then all of a sudden God asks you to bring it back? What God is literally saying here, children of God, is that he wants you and I to know if you love him more than what he has given you. We have fallen into this trap, saints, for loving things that God has given us more than the giver himself. And so God is in competition for our affection. God is in competition for our, our time. And so what God is asking Abraham here, you will understand, is very strange. Because he's asking him what the heathens do. Abraham hears a voice of God when you read your Bible. But what God is asking him does not match like the sound that he is listening to. Because what God is asking Abraham to do could only be done by the pagans. But he is listening to God, the Bible says, and God is literally asking Abraham to act like a heathen. And somehow, in spite of the nature of the command, Abraham still knew that it was God speaking to him. That in as much as whatever he was hearing sounded so strange, sounded like the acts of hidden, Abraham was still sure that he was listening to the voice of God. I would want to ask you a question. 
Are you so much in tune with God that even if God asks you to do something crazy, then you will still know that God is speaking? Have you really paid close attention on how God knocks at the door of your heart in your Christian walk? Because if you pay close attention to God, those who have lived with God enough, those who keep on listening to God each and every moment, know always. When God speaks. So God tells him that I need you to go to the land of Moriah and I will show you a mountain when you get there. That's what God tells Abraham. And with my sanctified imagination, I can see Abraham with tears in his eyes and faith in his heart. I can just imagine he packs everything that he needed. And left with his son. Scripture says he takes his two servants with him. Now the Bible says that when Abraham reached the land of Moriah, he tells the servants to wait, to wait somewhere. He says, wait here. Then he tells them, me and the boy, we are going up to the mountain. God has now revealed to him that this is the place. But before he goes to the revealed place, which I call the place of elevation, you can notice that he had to leave the people who came along with him. Because understand that when God gets ready to elevate you in life, when God gets ready to take you to a new level, when God gets ready to take you to a new assignment, when God gets ready to raise you to a new responsibility, not everyone who walked with you will go up with you, whatever God takes you. And some of you are complaining about people who don't call you anymore. It might be a sign that God is getting ready to elevate you. So Abraham moves. You should understand that if God kept some people in your life, they will talk you out of your miracle. And that's why, saints, you need to praise God not only for the doors that he opens, but praise God for the doors that he closes. Praise God for the people that he adds in your life. And also praise God for the people that he subtracts out of your life. The Bible records Abraham tells his two servants that you will stay here. Me and the boy, we will go up and we will worship and we will come back. I want you to notice the magnitude of that statement. From what I read, God said, take the boy to the mountain. Sacrifice the boy on the mountain. In other words, the boy is not supposed to come back. But I ask myself a question. Why would Abraham say this? That we will go, we will worship, and we will come back. It is because Abraham had that kind of faith. You see, saints, when you pray, you have to believe that God is able to do what he says he will do. When you pray, you have to believe that God is able to do the impossible in your life. And so what Abraham is doing here is that he speaks things that are not as though they already are. And what we need to do, saints, in our Christian walk is to have faith in God in a way that we are able to speak things before we see it. 
Uh, don't you know that God is attracted to our faith? When you walk, when you begin to walk into the impossible situation and say God is able, God is attracted to that kind of faith. When you can be able to say that, you know what? I know that you can provide to my family with one income. But God, can you now do it without an income? That God, I know you have enabled us to buy this new home with a job. But God, can you now provide mortgage without a job? That God, I know you can provide medicines and vaccines to heal people from diseases. But God, can you now provide medication for this virus? We've got to believe, children of God, that God is able to do the impossible. Not just saying it, but we've got to believe it. We've got to internalize it when we pray. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and its fullness. Abraham says that I don't know what's going to happen, but all I do know is that we are going to the mountain and we are going to come back because our God is attracted to our faith. For the Bible says that without faith, not without the Sabbath, not without the Ten Commandments, but the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please our God. They start climbing the mountain, Bible records. And Isaac says, Father, I see we've got everything for the sacrifice. But where is the sacrifice itself? And Abraham says to him, the Lord himself will provide. They get up and, 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 and Isaac lays down to the altar. Now the Bible does not tell us when Abraham told Isaac what was going on or what to, uh, was to happen. All we know is that in submission to his father, Isaac allows himself and is bound and lays down as a sacrifice. And now, Abraham lifts up his hand to plunge the knife through obedience into the heart of his only son. His loved son. And it is at this moment, saints, that God cries out to Abraham. Abraham. Abraham, I understand that he's, he calls him twice because Abraham is so focused on what God tells him to do. So God calls him again because he has passed the test. And God calls him, Abraham, Abraham, do not harm the boy. And this is my point, saints. I want you to listen to me carefully. That if Abraham had stopped listening to God, he would have killed Isaac in the name of obedience. He would have killed the promise by obeying what God had said instead of what God was saying. Are we together, church? He would have killed him. But I want you to notice something here. You see, some of us are so much stuck on the last word that God gave us. We are stuck on the last promise that God gave us. We are stuck on the last elevation that God gave us. But we have to realize that unless we keep listening to God, We can kill the bigger dreams that God has for us. 
What dream are you killing in your life because you stopped listening to God? Some of us are almost killing what God intended to live because you stopped praying so early. Because you stopped persevering in prayer. Because you prayed and stopped because nothing was coming forth in your life. Abraham would have been disobedient in his obedience if he stopped listening to God. The power of prayer is not the words that go up, but the words that come down. And if we stopped listening to God, we will miss what God is saying to us right now. I would still be obedient to my new beatitude. But before I finish, I want you to ask yourself the question. Are you listening to God right now? Or the last time you listened to God was last week after you bought your home, after you bought your new car, after you got the school fees and took the children to school? The power of our prayers in our Christian walk is not about the words that go up, but it's about the words that come down. A young boy was watching a movie as I conclude with his parents. This was those kind of movies that you don't know how it's going to end. So the young boy is seated there at the couch with their mother. He's biting his nails. They are holding each other because in the middle of the movie, the hero and the heroine look like they are going to die. And so in this, in that moment, there is tension. They are having tension as they watch. But meanwhile, as they are watching, the father is also there. And the father is leaning at the door frame. Confidently, and he is smiling as they watch together the movie. Now, the son is asking himself the question What does my father know about this movie that me and mommy do not know? Because in that, in that scenario, it's, it's a very tense situation. But well, at the end of the movie, everything works out well, and the hero and the heroine make it through. And then the child goes to his father and asks the father, Dad, how did you know that everything was going to be right? Did you already watch the movie? And then the dad said, no, son, I had not watched the movie before, but I had read the book. And because I had read the book, I, I knew the story. And I knew how it was going to end. Well, children of God, members of New Life Church, I may not know your life movie this moment, but all I can tell you is that I've read the book. And the book says that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I don't know about your life movie this moment. But all I can tell you is that I've read the book. And the book that says that they that have come out of great tribulation washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, they shall stand in the sea of glass. The kisses, the luos, the luyas, the kikuyus, People, white people, black people, they shall hold their hands hand in hand 
I don't know about your movie story, children of God, this morning. All I can tell you is that I have read the book. And the book says that our God shall wipe away all tears. And so keep listening to his voice. Because when we keep to be in tune with it, our God will see us through in our tribulation. Let us pray. Most gracious Father in heaven, in season and out of season, you are still our God. On top of the hills, down in the valleys, in sickness, in times of death, in times of high income, in times of no income, in times of having children and in times of trying to have a children, you are still our God. This Holy Sabbath, I lift your children of New Life Church unto thy hands. That you can meet all of them at the point of their needs. How I pray, my God, that in our Christian walk, we should keep listening to your voice each and every moment of our life. How I pray, Lord, that as your children lift their prayers to you, my God, they should come to a full realization that the power of prayer is not about that that comes to you, but it's more of what comes down to us through you. May we keep listening to your voice that when you come to take your children home, all of us may find our names in the book of life. That we shall be among that number who will confidently rejoice saying, Oh, this is our lovely king we've been waiting for. Bless us to this. As we finish this morning session. At the end of this worship this day, may honor and glory be to your holy name. For we pray trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you.